Hi, I'm Denise Graves, and I have spent most of my life as an opera singer and as an educator. The opera world knows me for my portrayals of two of opera's greatest, baddest femme fatales, Carmen and Delilah. But what you may not know is that as much as I love to burn up the stage, I also love to burn in the kitchen. I love to cook. So for me, singing and cooking reach people in the same way that is satisfying and that connects us. So I've blended together these two and created a talk show, a cooking show, and a performing platform all stirred up together. <laughs> and I know that you guys are the king of the puns. This is a great way to get your aggressions out. <laughs> Hell yeah. Can't burn the garlic. You cannot burn the garlic. This format for Cooking with Denise isn't like any other show. I am in my orchard and in my garden. CWD is reimagining presenting performing artists, classical artists, to the popular culture, to inclusive communities, and to the world. Stood up, I just said, Yes! yes! <laughs> the performing stage pouring the tea with our story. Oh, it's easy. The first thing you do is you put the clams in last. You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Distinctive recipes from all over the world. Tout le monde. Tell um, amore. Tell me grande amore. Plus life tips and ingredients for success. Allow nothing to impede whatever it is that your heart can dream of. Nothing. I, they want nothing it's to like do with you. The way Billie Eilish sings, like, and she doesn't talk to me for three days. You know what I mean? It's like, really? Come uh, uh, out. Well, it's pretty impressive what you did do. This is war now, Laura. Uh, right, right. <laughs> Where did the sugar go? Oh my God. <laughs> it so happened. Oh. This is so, so, so good. My goal is to serve and to nourish you inside and out. So join us. Let's get cooking. Hey everybody, welcome to Cooking with Denise. Thank you for joining us today. I am so excited today because we have one of the opera world's professions, great luminaries, joining us from his kitchen in Minnesota. One of the things that I want to say is that one of the shocking things that I learned early on um, after I finished my formal training, just before embarking um, on a career in this profession in the classical music industry, is that that was brutally um, apparent that the business side of the music industry was less beautiful than the actual performance part. Business is business, right? Except sometimes there are some people in the industry who make this such a pleasure in terms of the actual business aspect of it. And that's today's guest. Joining us from his kitchen in Minnesota is the president and general director of the Minnesota Opera, Ryan Taylor. Now, Ryan and I met, I think we met at Wolf Trap some seasons ago with our friend, our mutual friend, Jenny Friend. Um, and we were sort of dinner partners that evening and we had a really good time and it felt really familiar. He felt really comfortable to me. Um, and it was a real, real pleasure. Um, I'm not sure that he was yet in that. He may have been he may have been in his previous position um, in um, Arizona at that time. Sometimes the business can be brutal, like businesses can be. But this is someone whom um, is kind. You, all you have to do is look at his face. You'll see it. You'll see the kindness and the warmth in his face who puts you at ease right away. Um, so he has made this entire... Um, He's changed a lot of the perceptions that I hold about general managers. Um, 
Another one was early on Ed Purrington, who's no longer with us. He was probably one of the nicest people. And then Tim O'Leary, for sure. And then I would say Ryan Taylor, not necessarily in that order, but just one of the, a real humanitarian, someone who's kind and, um, and generous and um, really sees things, I think, from the singer's perspective. He himself is a singer. And so he's sort of one, he's sort of one of the great examples of what can happen and what you can do when you start out singing. Um, he's risen to the top of his profession and joins us today from his kitchen in Minnesota. Find your light. That's a saying in live performance, find your light. It refers to when a performer steps out onto the stage into a specific spot where they can be fully seen by the audience. And as a performer, you understand when you find that place because while your outward vision becomes blurred from the glare and intensity of the lights, you feel nothing but warmth all around you. And in that moment, when you take that step, you move left or right, forwards or backwards, you adjust and you find your light. Ladies and gentlemen, the president and the general manager of the Minnesota Opera that I love so much, Ryan Taylor. Ryan, where are you? I'm here and I appreciate it so much. It's there great he to is. You. And so uh, it's normally I don't have to cook while I'm blushing so much. That was such a generous introduction. Well, it's so true. It's so easy. And, you know, just recently we spent um, a weekend together in Atlanta in your hometown. And uh, my hotel wasn't ready yet. So he invited me to his home with his mom. And we sat around and we ate sushi and we <laughs> talked about life. And, and, and he and I went to the grocery store together. So it's been a pleasure to get to know you. Um, and I think that that's really important. I, I think it's really important that when I don't know, when artists have relationships with the general manager, managers, usually, certainly in my experience, there's been a, an enormous distance, um, whether that happens naturally or people feel, in, or singers feel intimidated, um, not feeling like you can approach the GM about what's going on. Maybe that was my stance a lot in the profession, but um, you are someone who puts people really at ease. And, um, you know, as I was saying, you're just, you're very, very warm and, um, and, you, and you're open and you invite um, the opinions on the impressions of the artist. And I think that's important too, because I think a lot of times um, singers feel kind of like they're just sort of, you know, the hired entertainment and that you don't really have a voice in what happens with whatever it is that you're creating together. Um, and with you, one does not feel that. It feels like we're actually collaborating and working on something together. So thank you so much for that beautiful part. But I know that you're also from the South and that's part of that Southern hospitality that, um, you, that, the, that, that the South has been so identified with too. Mm -hmm. and, and I can say that because I met your mom and I sat in your home and she was incredibly also just like you and you can see where you get that from, just really warm and, and very open and you feel comfortable right away. So thank you for your time. I know how busy, well, actually I don't know how busy <laughs> it is to run an opera company. I have no clue, but I know that the, the demands on your time must be great. It, and it has been a challenge during COVID um, like no other. Yeah, and I, I will say that I have so much respect uh, for general directors who've taken on their first job in this last 14 month period. They're people who are brand new and walked into running a company during COVID. And I, I, I felt unprepared to manage through a pandemic. I can't imagine taking on this assignment uh, during such a challenging period. So I, I have a great deal of respect for them too. That's wonderful. Well, it's always wonderful to, to hear a different perspective about how it's been. We've spoken with a lot of singers um, during um, the pandemic when we've been doing um, the episodes for the cooking show, but I think we had you and Francesca. So um, it's always wonderful to have that other perspective. So I know that in addition to creating beautiful productions and creating beautiful music and all the different things that you've managed to do, it, with your life, that one of the things you also enjoy doing 
is cooking. Actually, when I visited you, you were in your home, you were making bread. And this is how committed he was to it. He, he, he took a flight from Minnesota to Atlanta and he filled up his suitcase with all of his different flowers and all of his different tools that he needed to make bread for his mother from Mother's Day. Well, how gorgeous. I, I had my mom and my dad and my stepmom who had been saying, we, we keep seeing these loaves of bread you've been making during quarantine, but we haven't been able to taste them. And I, I don't feel like shipping a loaf of bread is really gonna do it justice. So right. I think since I was gonna go anyway, it was the right time to bring all of my uh, my tools, my kit, and put it all together. And it, it turned out really well. Ah, I'm sorry I didn't get to taste any, but I do have the great opportunity today with the recipes that you shared with us that we're gonna make today, to use one of your original creations, right? It's true, it's true. It's, I've been using this for about 20 years. Uh, it's a dry barbecue rub that you're holding. Um, I, I forget which one of my friends nicknamed it for me. I did not name it, but I've kept it as Ryan's Rowdy Rub. Um, <laughs> it feels like, uh, I think barbecue for me, you know, barbecue means something different, Where depending on where you live in the South and what your traditions are and what your uh, what you're used to, uh, sauces are very different, rubs are very different. Um, and for me, this kind of barbecue always feels like bursting into spring, early summer, like you just want to get some chicken and corn on the grill and uh, something that I'd have around the 4th of July, especially. So I, I thought it would be fun for us to cook something up uh, as it's starting to get warmer and really pretty across the country. And we're starting to emerge from this pandemic period and it, it just feels like uh, the right kind of meal. That's it, exactly. And I'm so excited. So tell me what we're in for today because I am ready. I've got all of my ingredients here and I want to have a beautiful Southern meal with you and uh, or a summer meal with you. And um, so what are we going to make today? All right. So we're just going to and I will say you can either do this on the stovetop with the oven or you can do it on a grill outside and the preparation is exactly the same. So because we're uh, recording today, I figured I'd do it inside and you have a fancy griddle on your uh, sto on your stove over there. I am not so fortunate. I just have the four burner eyes. So I'm gonna do everything all at once in the iron skillet, which is also great if, it's, if you live somewhere like Minnesota and it gets cold sometimes, oh, randomly, uh, late May even. Um, you may not want to stand outside at the grill. Uh, so you can do it all up in an iron skillet, but once you've prepared it, you can actually just take it and it's exactly the same prep period if you've got a good uh, a good grill outside. So we're going to do some grilled chicken, or in this case, baked chicken, yeah. and some grilled corn. And we're going to use that barbecue rub on both the corn and the chicken, slightly wow. different preparations, and, uh, and we'll get going. All right, so talk me through it. I'm ready. All right. So what should we get? What should we start first, the corn or the chicken? Let's start on the chicken. Uh, okay. Because we want, we want the rub to actually sit on the chicken for a little bit. One gotcha. of the cool things is that, you know, people have different ideas when you're going to do something on the grill about how long you want to marinate something. And for me, I often finish work at 5, 30, 6 o'clock, and I've got somebody coming for dinner at 7. And oh, I have nice. time to make a marinade and pop it in there and sit it in the bag and let it I don't have time for any of that. So right. this is part of the reason why I love this rub is that you can put it straight on the chicken and let it sit for about 12 minutes and then it's ready to go. And you don't have to worry about a marinade. And it All really right. does seal the chicken, even though this has no skin. I'm using a um, boneless, skinless breast today, uh, but the rub will actually seal it quite nicely. So you get a good crunch on the outside of that chicken. Um, yeah. The first thing I would mention is that I don't wash my chicken. Some people do wash their chicken. I prefer to pull it out, leave it on the counter for just a couple minutes before you're ready. Make sure to pat it dry on both sides. Um, it'll still have a little bit of moisture on it, but okay. you're going to want to just make sure that you get the majority of the, of the um, juices that the chicken comes in off of the outside. Right. So I'm just using a paper towel and, uh, and blotting it dry. Toss that out. And then um, I sent you, I think, the same kind of jar that I have. Sometimes I do it with the shaker tops. 
but these yeah. are actually just sort of an open jar at the top. And I don't know who decided they were going to redo measuring spoons in this sort of elongated shape, but it's great because they fit in the jar. Aha. Uh -huh. so, so let me check. I've got some of those too. So I love them. Um, and it seems like that's just a recent phenomenon that they have uh, these sort of elongated measuring spoons. I'll probably end up using about four or five tablespoons of rub to coat both sides of these two breasts of chicken that I'm cooking. You want to give it a pretty healthy um, coating. Don't, don't be shy. All right. As you put this on. And when we get the uh, when we get the chicken in the oven, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what's actually in the rub because that's okay. that is a very personal thing depending on who you are and where you come from as well. But there's some some building blocks that are pretty basic that you can use no matter where you are and what your preferences are. Right. And you look like you're doing a whole mess of chicken today. Well, I've got a lot of people here at the house. Yep. And so we've got. And also because I'm, I'm not cooking every day. Yeah. You know, I'd like to prepare some things and you know how it is with our, our lives. You've got to grab something and go. And if you have something that's really nutritious and good. Yeah. And this is, um, I, I'll be real honest. There's a little bit of sugar in the rub. I can see that. Um, but there's also a good bit of salt and seasonings and spices and different kinds of peppers. Um, but it's, it is on the whole a pretty healthy grill or a pretty healthy bake. Right. You're doing such a good job. <laughs> so for today's giveaway, the question is this, which voice type is Ryan Taylor? The first two people to email the correct answer at cookingwithdenise at gmail.com will receive two bottles of the opera blend spice what is ryan taylor's voice type please be sure to include your name and address good luck your kitchen is sparkling my goodness I, I knew i was coming on camera with you today ah oh, so and to make sure that everything looked good for the camera looks great all right terrific super so now that you've got the seasoning on your chicken Yes. We're going to let that sit. I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, one of the eyes on my stove. Yep, I've got um, that going here too. So that the uh, so that your skillet starts to heat up. I'm also not going to use oil uh, in the oh, skillet. Oh, I wondered about that, yeah. Um, I'm just going to let it be like, it's almost like when you do something on the grill, it's dry out there. I mean, sometimes people will do like a, a light coating of a, of a uh, an oil with a high burn rate so that it doesn't smoke too badly. Right. But for this, I actually don't use it. Um, it's a okay. pretty, quick, uh, it's pretty quick on the stove. So, um, and the, the rub will do what it needs to do in order to keep the chicken from sticking too badly to the, to the skillet. Okay. And do you have a story about your iron skillet? Lots of times people have like emotional ties or family history behind their, their iron skillets. No, I know that my voice teacher travels with it. Like she travels oh my gosh. with an iron skillet. Oh you know, gosh. I know a lot of performers who try. I, I did a lot with uh, Zubin Mehta mid-career. Yeah. And he would travel with a lot of spices and that sort of thing. And I know that Patti LaBelle would do the same thing. But my <laughs> voice teacher travels with her iron skillet. Like, oh my gosh. No, I, I would. I can't say that I have a. I have a personal story about it. I have several of them. Um, I remember them fondly from when I was a little kid. My mother cooked in them all the time. But um, no, I don't really have a story that goes along with the ones that I have. Do you? I, I don't. I, I inherited one from my dad's mother at one point, but it had gone so far beyond what was usable and she hadn't used it for a long time it was badly rusted and sometimes you can bring them back and i i consulted a bunch of people on how to do that and and eventually i went out and bought a new skillet so um <laughs> so my, my skillet's pretty new um but now that i figured out how to clean it it makes all the difference in the world and it it's starting to develop that really nice patina that keeps it kind of exactly you know yeah you've got to condition it first that's terrific absolutely so 
Do you feel like your pan is getting hot? It's doing pretty well. I'm gonna go ahead and um, and make the rub for the corn. Okay. It's a mixture that is yeah. butter, lime juice, and a taste a tablespoon of the barbecue rub. Um, so I actually pulled out a little while ago before we got started, I just pulled my butter out of the refrigerator. Um, yeah. Not quite half a stick, it's maybe three tablespoons or so of butter. Um, I'm gonna chop, uh, chop a lime and just juice half of a lime into, right. that, uh, into that room temperature butter. Yeah. And then uh, once I've got the juice in there, I'm also gonna put just a tablespoon of the barbecue rub. And this is actually, I think, in style, pretty similar. If we were to add some cheese, this is pretty similar to what you'd get if you think of like a Mexican street corn, like elote. Oh, right, sure. I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. Um, it's just got a very different kind of uh, southern barbecue complexity to it. Um, <laughs> and to be honest, I, I really love Mexican corn. <laughs> I do too. Um, I was quite uh, impressed that we could find it here at the farmer's market in Minnesota. There's a whole booth dedicated to Mexican corn and it, it's delicious. Lots of beautiful things in the garden right now. I've got some cabbage going. I've got some squash. I've got lots of zucchini. Hey, 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 the dog just ate a the dog. Oh my gosh, the dog just grabbed a zucchini. Oh, well. I guess it's okay. probably grow corn on your farm, don't you? We, we don't. Our neighbors do, but we grow all kinds of other things, but we don't have corn. But you can get it fresh, no matter... Oh, yeah, we can get it fresh right down the street. Yeah. So that's the best kind to get, and, it's, and people will argue with you from all over the country where you can get the best sweet corn. Um, but I like to take the corn and pull the husks back and desilk uh, the cob, so you've got your corn ready to go. Um, yeah. I will tell you that I'm going to be polite and not use my hands, which is what I normally do when I'm preparing this, but we're, we're going to look more professional today. I'm going to use a spoon or a knife and just slather that um, the ear with this barbecue rub. It's kind of oh, a pinkish, huh. um, yeah. burgundy sort of color when you get it on the corn. And you want to try and get it down into all of the little... Uh, Crack sure. mm, Beautiful. Smear that in nicely. And then once you've got that on your corn, you can actually fold the husks back up over the corn. Like an umbrella. Like an umbrella. And it will, yeah. it will help keep, um, it'll help keep the butter and spices on the cob as it's cooking. Right. And help infuse the kernels with some of that flavor. So. Uh. I pull that right back up. And then one of the things that I do, I think in my drawer, I have some twine. So I'm just going to take a little piece of twine and wrap right around just some cotton cooking twine, just to make sure that the husks stay closed during the cooking process. Right. Oh, that's a lovely idea. Oh, how wonderful. Let's see if I can find it. Yep. With the lime in there too, this is going to be, this is going to be delicious. It's pretty good. And I have to say, you know, all of this is so dependent on what your tastes are like and what your guests' tastes are like. Right. And, you know, so if you've got somebody that likes something a little bit spicier, you can always chop up a little jalapeno and put that in the butter and the rub. Right. Um, it'll just give it a little extra kick. Uh, you could actually close up some feta or some cotilla cheese. Oh, sure. Um, 
I, I, especially as I'm thinking early summer and trying to do things out on the grill that are a little healthier, I like to stay away from adding butter and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm trying. I'm trying real, real hard to do things. <laughs> so that's where we are. But you've got your uh, once you've got your corn prepared and all tied up, then it's ready for either the grill or the frying pan. Or the frying pan. I mean the the skillet that I'm in. Uh huh. I'm gonna put this on the grill. I think that is gonna serve you well. Them. And how long do you let your corn cook? Because my husband says you you put the corn on the heat source, you say the Lord's Prayer, and it's done. <laughs> it's, that's quick. Um, that's quick, I think. That is quick. I will tell you that if I'm doing it on a skillet, I will put it in at the same time as the chicken, and I will take yeah. the corn out before I finish the chicken in the oven. Oh, right. Okay. So probably just about... 10 minutes for me, 10 or 12 minutes on the, on the stove top right. and thing on the grill. All right. So that moves pretty quickly. Are you cooking for someone? How many pieces of corn do you have going there? I just have two. I have two breasts and two pieces of corn. I'm actually okay. heading out of town tomorrow, so I didn't want to make too much, but I wanted oh, to leave for uh, my friends to watch my dog. All right. And during the uh, during the pandemic, I've had some friends from down the block who are not uh, always the most gifted in the kitchen. And <laughs> okay. I tend to make a little more than I would eat and take some down the street so that they've got some fresh cooked meals in their kitchens. Oh, Ryan, that's so lovely. That's a beautiful thing to do. It's just, uh, it's fun, you know, and you feel like it was a way of connecting with folks when we were all sort of locked up apart. I am all set. And I just wanted to point out, just in case, you know, you can see when the chicken has started to absorb the rub because it gets a little darker. I and see that. There will be some pockets where the rub, uh, you have a little much in one area. That's totally fine. But yeah. that's when the chicken's ready to go on the grill or into the skillet is when it's got that darkened flavor and you can see the rub really adhering to the meat. No. Oh. So I'm going to start with my corn. My okay. steak is, is hot. So I'm going to start with that. All right. I'll put mine back here. Get that into the skillet. I can hear it starting to sizzle a little bit. Yeah. And then I'm just going to put these chicken breasts right into the skillet with the corn. So the rub, let me talk a little bit about what's in the rub, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the secret ingredient that I found some 15, 20 years ago. Okay. Um, so a lot of times, uh, barbecue rub is a combination of sugar and salt, but you also have things like celery seed. Um, some people will use cardamom. Uh, oh, I love cardamom. Some people will use, I had a, let's see what I put in here. There was ground red chipotle pepper, uh, I don't know if I've said celery seed already. <laughs> uh, some paprika. Yeah. Um, and, and then the thing that really makes it for me is that a lot of times um, people will use liquid smoke when they're cooking. Oh, in yeah. To oh, give, sure. To give it that kind of outdoor grill flavor. And yeah. I, I never liked liquid smoke. Okay. Um, it, to me, it feels like it's got some kind of chemically something to it. So I really was searching for something that, that would eliminate the need for liquid smoke. Your corn is amazing. I want to be in your house right now. <laughs> that looks delicious. Oh, so good. And what I ended up finding was a smoked black Chinese tea. Um, yeah, I'm listening. And so if you, uh, I take the Chinese tea, it's just a loose tea, and I'll put it in a coffee grinder and turn mm -hmm. it into a powder. And then I can incorporate it in the, in the rub mixture. So the darkest flecks in that rub are, um, are part of that smoked black tea. Yeah. Gosh. Oh, here we 
So I'm starting to hear a little bit of the corn pop. So I'm just going to rotate them about a quarter of a turn in the skillet. My chicken is starting to plump relatively nicely. So is that ready to hit the pan? Not yet. I have put the chicken in the pan with the corn. All right. So I better get my chicken going then. Yeah, you can get your chicken in the skillet. That'll be great. All right, here we go. It's always fun to try and cook inside and, and make sure that you're not going to set off the fire alarm. <laughs> exactly. In New York, I do that all the time in our place in New York. My gosh. Well, what's interesting to me is that the the chicken can get such a good seal on it that it might start to dance a little bit in your skillet because uh, it'll it'll uh, develop some uh, as the moisture in the chicken starts to get hotter and hotter. The steam will start moving through the chicken and it kind of pops up every once in a while. That's normal. <laughs> okay. You do not have Mexican jumping chicken. <laughs> What were those? When I was a kid, there were things called Mexican jumping beans. I have no idea what they were. Sure. I think my corn is just about done there. I think your corn looks good. Yeah, I think the corn is, I think we're there. So how do you like... Um, how do you like eating your corn? Do you leave it on the cob or do you cut it off the cob? No, I leave it on the cob and get messy right. with the whole thing. Absolutely. So no, I like it on the cob with the butter, you know, sliding all over the place. Oh, and, yeah. oh yeah. my gosh. And some of the Ryan's rowdy rub up there, the whole deal. I remember my, my grandmother had corn holders that looked like tiny pieces of corn with these uh, spikes on it. You'd poke them into each of the side of the corn so you didn't have to get your fingers messy. They never worked. I know. For, especially for a little person with tiny fingers trying to use these little, you just gotta grab the corn. I know. No messing around. All right, so I'm gonna flip my chicken over. It's been about five minutes. It's got a really nice, I'm gonna pull it up to the pull it up to the camera so you can see it. But that side of the chicken has got a really nice sort of uh, char on the outside. Oh, that's that's gorgeous. Um, and the that corn is gorgeous. looking nicely. That's beautiful. So I should say that this same preparation, if you're if you don't love chicken breast or you you eat too much chicken breast and you want to do a pork chop, or you want to do a, a nice piece of white fish. Uh, you prepare everything exactly the same way. You're going to want to cut your cooking time a little bit if it's fish. Uh, wow! Yeah, will work. Great idea about the white fish. That's fabulous. I think we're done with the corn over here. I'm going to take that corn off. It looks amazing. Yeah. And it, you've been actually like buttering the corn as you go, right? Right. Woo. All right. So my corn is feeling pretty good. I may actually end up leaving mine in with the chicken when I pop it in the oven just to keep it a little bit warm. Sure. So I like to finish. Uh, whether you're doing any any kind of uh, stove to oven chicken, I think it's important to give it a good sear on both sides and then finish it in the oven. Um, I agree. Helps keep it warm and juicy and flavorful. Minnesota Opera is a place that holds um, a tremendous amount of meaning for me. The very first opera that I was, the very first title that I was offered, the title role of Carmen, was with Minnesota Opera.
and it was one of the most beautiful experiences of my career, without a doubt. Um, we, it was a new production. We had two weeks to put it together. We did that production with the dialogue. Um, I was the newbie in the group. I was with a lot of people, a lot of vets in uh, business who had done it a lot of times. I was really afraid and really scared and learning how to play the castanets and learning how to dance and do all these different things that are required um, to be able to do that role. I was really, really super nervous and everybody in that cast put me at ease. And I had such a wonderful time that when it was time to leave that engagement, I couldn't leave. I actually stayed a week longer just in the hotel. I cried so much having to let that performance go and let that experience go. And mine, mine feels like it's ready to head into the oven. So I'm going to really? pop it down in there. I started my chicken a little before you did though. Okay. And, and I had some pretty big pieces too. Yeah. Yeah. I had some, I had some smaller breasts that I was using. Yours definitely looked like the, the farmhouse share. Right. <laughs> How often do you have a chance to prepare something in a, in a big way that you can sort of eat off of during the week? Do you try to do it once a week or a couple of days? Well, we, do it quite, we do it quite a lot here because, well, it depends. And now it's going to be the summertime where we have more of the family around. Um, but usually on the weekends when people, when everybody's here, yeah, yeah, because we go back and forth between New York and the farmhouse. So usually when we've got, oh no, I think that could be up a little bit higher. I'm not sure that my chicken is ready yet. I think some of these breasts. We might need a little extra yeah, I think this this needs a little extra time for sure. You're, you're now going to hear me use one of my favorite cooking tools that is not a cooking tool, and that is my Apple Watch. Hey Siri, set a timer for nine minutes. <laughs> nine minutes so I, I never, of the many things I can do in the kitchen, I can never remember whether I'm setting the oven timer, the microwave timer, whether there's a timer that I have to, you know, twist like a clock, like the old fashioned timers, egg timers that we used to use. Um, right. But Siri has really kind of saved my life to be able to just say, you know, <laughs> set an alarm sure. for me, make sure that I get it out of the oven before it burns. That's right. Yeah, I, I don't use it uh, use it so much, but I know my kids use it all the time to set timers for themselves. Uh, I don't, well, you know what? That's not true. I actually manually set the timer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm it's... Uh, I got very tired of Siri's standard voice, and so I switched it to an Irish accent recently, and it makes me feel like I'm somewhere <laughs> ex exotic. I had that conversation yesterday. We had someone, we did a cooking show with one of these very fancy cake makers and he had his on an English, I think it was an English accent. Yeah. And uh, that's a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. Okay. This just looks so divine. So did you tell us about the rub? I know you said you don't like the liquid smoke. I don't. So I ended up using um, a smoked black Chinese tea. Um, and the kind of tea that I really like is pretty readily available if you have a good tea shop. Um, we have one in Minneapolis called uh, the Society du Thé. Um, oh. And uh, it's been around for over 20 years here, um, right up on Hennepin Avenue, or Lindale. It's on Lindale. So um, I just, and I actually panicked when I was getting ready to make your rub because I thought I had some leftover black tea here from the last time I made it. Um, and it was in a blue bag. I knew exactly what it looked like. Couldn't find it to save my life. And I knew I had to make the rub that day so that I could overnight it to you this past Monday and have it arrive in time for today's show. And uh, so I, I woke up in the morning. I started making everything. I could not find the tea. I ran right over to the Society of Tea and I picked up some Lapsang Souchon. Um, et voila. Et voila. And et voila. That's the black tea that I use, and it's it's oh. really delicious. And it's I've tried to make tea with it. It is a surprisingly savory tea. 
um, because it really does taste like <laughs> grill water. <laughs> to me, because it is this no. beautiful, beautifully smoked, right? It doesn't sound very good, but it's delicious in the rub. And, and for me, that took the place of of the liquid smoke so that it you just don't have to have that added chemical stuff in there. It's just a naturally smoked leaf. Um, and how did you come up with the right recipe and the right proportions of everything? Was that just a trial and error thing? There's a lot of trial and error involved for me. I'm also not as big a fan of celery seed um, as some of, some other people in my family. So I, I reduce the amount of celery seed in the rub just a little bit. Um, but it's really, I mean, you, you just kind of have to play with it over time. And I've been doing it for so long that it's, it's uh, largely red pepper and paprika, a uh, little bit of celery seed, a little bit of cardamom. Um, I feel like there's one ingredient I'm missing that I'll have to send you. Maybe you can post it in the, in sure. the you know, sure. comments or something, but. But for me, it's it's all about just that combination of flavors and then adding this little bit of smoke with the tea. And I just pulverize, actually, I've got it here in this cabinet. I have a little teeny like spice grinder and yeah. I just throw the, the loose tea into the spice grinder and, and grind it until it's a powder. Holy um, moly. So, it, so it, I it has worked out. Well done indeed. I think my chicken can probably go in the oven now. Did you put yours in already, Ryan? I did. It's going to come out in about five minutes, I think. Oh so boy! So I'm behind the times. No, just about five. I'm going to get that. In. I'm going to get that. Get mine in there. You're also doing a lot more than I do. It's true. Yeah. I mean, you have a whole a whole mess of chicken and corn. Right, because I have a house full of people over here, <laughs> and I just have two of each. It's going to be dinner tonight and then something for my uh, dog sitter to munch on when they come oh. over, when I go out oh. town. All right, here we go. This is going, that, that is, now that's it. If you want to hurt somebody, that iron skillet right there, holy moly. Don't drop that on your toe. Don't drop that. I do have to say too, you're, I'm jealous of the size of your skillet. That is, that's a piece of metal right there. Right, right. And you know, I'm going to put, I'm going to make a little salad along with that, just so we have something green. Yep. yep. So I'm, and you know, when I lived in France, we always made our salad dressing. And yep. that's something that I kept with me coming to, uh, coming to America. I will coming back to, uh, we always bought it. You know, when I was a kid, we loved, uh, you know, French was the French dressing, which the, of course the French know nothing about. They're like, what's that? Like, like all the French yeah. things like, you know, French manicure, like French dressing. They're like, what is that? <laughs> it's sort of um, like the ketchup and mayonnaise combination. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And maybe a little sweet relish. I think I'm gonna put, I think I'm gonna put a little bit of your rub in there. We'll mm -hmm. see. But I'm gonna do a little oil and vinegar. What? And I like to use um, rice vinegar. Yeah. And I think I'll put a little bit of lime in there too. That's delicious. But it's always so much fun coming up with different ones. And sometimes you hit a really good one. Yeah. And then you don't know what it is you did. Yep. And you can't sort of recall it, but we, we would always have these contests in our house about who came up with the best you know, salad dressing. Amazing. And do you, do you put just a little bit of mustard in there, too, before you, you shake it You better believe it. It's right here. I love that Dijon mustard. Yep. I love that particular bite. Yeah. Uh, that's piquant. I put some um, garlic in there because, like, duh, garlic. Mm -hmm. You got to have that. A little bit of salt and pepper. And uh, it's different every time. I, I love the salt and pepper. Uh, holders. I, it makes so much sense, right? I keep it right on the stove. Yep. And uh, there we are. And we'll put a little bit of Dijon in there. I love Dijon mustard. Oh my gosh, I could just... Delicious. It's not, it's not everybody's cup of tea, that's for sure. As it were. You ever put, um, put a little honey in it, too. Yeah. 
you ever add like herbs from your garden into the mix? All the time. What, so what's your favorite herb that you end up putting into Somebody your just ask that. Um, I would say I really love rosemary. Yeah. I cook with it a lot. And um, dill. Yeah. I love dill because the smell of it is just, I just like crushing it up and yes. smell it in my hands. It's so wonderful. I think I'm, I think I'm going to add some of your rub to that. Maybe it's going to be overkill on the rub today between the corn and the, I don't think so. Go, go lightly on the rub for the dressing and it'll probably just complement it just enough. Okay. I'm going to put some of that in there. And then what do you do? You put some, you, you also have some barbecue sauce on the side. Uh, on occasion, uh, I will either make barbecue sauce. Um, yeah. I have a recipe for that. I didn't do that today. Or there's a, you know, you can get like a store-bought barbecue sauce. And for each cup of barbecue sauce, I'll stir in like a tablespoon of the rub. And folks think I have made barbecue sauce uh, because none of the store-bought sauce has the, the same kind of texture and, and sort of flex of uh, that tea. So um, that's why I would use a store bought and just mix in a little rub. It's kind of a shortcut. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah. That's terrific. It's you just know, so much fun, you know? As you were talking about herbs, um, I did get some organic cilantro from the farmer's market this past weekend, and I have a little bit of it left over. My friend Margaret, uh, I, I could never keep herbs fresh in my refrigerator or my kitchen. I don't know why it didn't occur to me to pop them in a little bit of water and put a bag over them in the fridge. Right. Um, but she taught me how to do that just a couple years ago. So I have some pretty decent cilantro here that's left over from last weekend. And I'm going to actually cut that up and use it as a bit of a garnish on the top of the chicken and the corn. Ooh. I love cilantro. I know I a lot of people do not like cilantro. So I, I, I think of it as the danger herb. True. Either you like it or you don't. I mean, it's a very, very, very particular taste. I love it. Yeah, me too. But some people think it tastes like soap. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that. Sure. Remember when we were kids? Of course, you couldn't get away with it now. But if you said a bad word, our parents would say. Remember? I've heard of this. I will say I got very lucky, and that my parents never did the the soap treatment. Right. Um, <laughs> right. I also think I was something of a nerd when I was younger and probably didn't use a lot of bad words around my folks, but it's not that I didn't. You've got a lot of catching up to do then, Ryan. You're behind. I should start now. Start now. Yeah, definitely. Let me see. I'm going to get that on a... I'm going to take one of my ears of corn and start to peel it apart and see what I've got here. Uh Uh-huh. I wonder how we're doing over here on the chicken. Let me just take a look. I think I can turn that off now. Oops. Yeah, we're moving right along over here. How is okay. it, it? I have to say, I don't have the grill marks that you have, but it smells amazing. That looks beautiful. Um, and it's just gorgeous. And actually, it's beautiful. one of the things that I'm always amazed at, you know, I, I, you mentioned I had left, lived in Phoenix before I moved up here to Minnesota. Yes. And I went back and forth. The opera company there performs in Phoenix and in Tucson. And I got to where I just loved uh, tamales. And every time I work with a piece of corn and I see the husks, I, I, I'm like, I'd really like to learn how to do that. And I don't think, I don't think I have it in me quite yet, but at some point I may want to learn. Sure. Let me see how we're doing over here. I mean, that looks just delicious. I think we're, I'm going to steal a little piece. (laughs) I think, I think we're just about there over here. And are you there with your corn or your chicken or both? Um, I think we're just about there with our um, ch- chicken, for sure. The corn is done. Oh, wow. Corn is definitely done. Yum. And uh, I'm just going to see if we taste a little piece here. Um, the chicken. 
but it just, it smells fantastic. I don't see what. And you know, you did, you did a salad uh, so that you had something green. One of the things that I prepared yesterday was just a little slaw. Um, oh. And there's a, there's a really, I didn't like slaw as a kid either. So I'm fascinated by this stuff that I couldn't eat as a kid that now I just love. Uh, but they, uh, if you go to the store now, they have pre-mixed slaws with, that are like superfood slaws that have cabbage and kale and broccoli and all kinds of things mixed in. So I took one of those and added just a little bit of dried cranberry to it. Sometimes Ooh. I'll do it um, with a little peach vinegar, uh, oh. and some cinnamon, and a little mayonnaise. And I use that as my slaw recipe, and it's pretty good, too. Oh, so it sounds... That sounds fantastic. And I'm cheating. I'm eating a little bit of the chicken because it's so good. It's so good. And that little bit of sweetness there with the sugar from the, the rub is fantastic. Oh, Thank you. I love it. And you've got to get them. You've got to have that for sale in the opera shops. Do you think people would buy the I would. Rub? Heck yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah, why not? I, have, I haven't ever thought that you created. I'm sure there are people who love you and who are very interested in what you're doing and, you know, your neighbors that you're always taking food to and the dog sitter and and all of the Ryan Taylor fans. But, with, but, with, I'm sorry? Both of the fans? <laughs> I think that's you and my mom. <laughs> I think that well, that's a wonderful idea. I think you've got to package that and have that in the opera shops at the uh, so people can buy it at intermission. So um, because you began extolling the virtues of the bread that I made on Mother's Day, I will I will just show you the leftover little bit of the of the loaf that I created this week. Um, this was an experiment I did. That's a Kalamata olive rosemary loaf. Oh, right. Um, and I, I have to say, this was some good bread. That <laughs> looks spectacular. It's just gorgeous. And the flavor profile, just to have a little olive oil on it. Uh, the last couple of mornings, I've, I've poached an egg with a house guest of mine, a friend of mine, Fenlon, who was staying for a few days. And she would drizzle a little olive oil and put a poached egg on the top. And it was beautiful. Just beautiful. How wonderful. Oh, my goodness. So how's, I love that. How's everything coming for you? I think we're ju I think we're just about there. So yeah. I think I can. Yeah. Are you Are you ready on your end? I think we can. I think we can plate it. I'm set. Yeah. All right. All right. Then let's let me uh, get this. Let me get the show on the road over here. Then. Yeah. It looks. Everything looks. And you know what? And it's fast. That was pretty quick. I mean, was pretty quick. We slowed down a little bit because we were talking, but but it's a pretty quick come together meal. Oh, look at you! You're all you're all. Yeah, it's really quick. It's hearty. It's delicious. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Right, too. That's the thing, especially if you're not going to put this like uh, a heavy sauce on the meat. Um, it's a pretty light dish. Oh my goodness. Well, okay, let me get that going here. How's it smell over there? Uh, just like Christmas morning. I mean, it's just fabulous. If Christmas happened on the 4th of July. That's right. <laughs> oh, those are beautiful. That's gorgeous. Now let me see. We'll put a little salad there with that. So did you say that you had stolen a little piece of chicken when you were? I, I did. Yeah. I stole a little piece of chicken. That's so great. There we are, because it was so good, I could not resist. Look at your gorgeous plate. Isn't that something? That's beautiful. And are those cherry tomatoes you put on the top or peppers? Cherry tomatoes on the top. Yeah. A little pop of color, a little brightness with the, you know, the lime juice. I love and the it. Chicken, and you've got the barbecue sauce for on the side for dipping, if if you want to do that. Yeah. And that gorgeous corn. I have to say, I'm now I'm I'm super jealous of your of your griddle right there inside. 
because that you, have, you that, have to be careful, right? Yeah, you do, but but the result that you get being able to see that char on the corn is just beautiful. Well, you know, they have those. I have one too that you know the George Foreman inside griddle. Yeah, and they have those little uh, you know portable ones that you can have on the inside of the house too. I do have yeah. a grill pan. I have a grill pan. Yeah, there too. you go. So I just hadn't thought about doing my corn on that. Yeah. Like, you know, I, yeah. I loved having that option and knowing that you can put it all in, all in there together. And that's even better, I think, because you I get agree. the flavor from everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Perfect. I only like cleaning as little as possible. Oh. <laughs> you know, the cooking, I love. The cleaning, not so much. Right. So just, one pan is always good for me. Very good. Yeah. Oh, well, this is wonderful. Ryan, I just, I'm so grateful to you for your time and for sharing of all this, this delicious meal with us today yeah. and for, for gifting us with your wonderful special Ryan's Rowdy Rub, which I love, which you, I could just eat that with a spoon. That's so good. It's, it's pretty good that way. <laughs> <I really laughs> It's awesome. It's awesome. And look at this fantastic. Oh my gosh. Look at this fantastic meal here. We've got to be sure that it, ah, that's beautiful. And what do you have? Oh, that's your slaw. Yep. I just did a little bit of slaw. Oh my gosh. That's wonderful. And then you put a little cilantro on top of your corn. Corn and the, and the chicken. Yep. Oh, Ryan, I'm coming over. I want to go there. I want part of that salad too. Well, we can certainly arrange that. I know that you usually come to, I don't know what your summer plans are, but I know you usually come to Wolf Trap. I do. I'm and actually I think, trying, to, I'm trying to figure that out I, in a few days. I think that they're planning a season this season. So yep. if you come, let me know. I think that would be great. I would love to have you over and just sit and gaze at you and we can make some things together. And because I want to taste some of that bread. That's what I want. Yeah, I, I'll have to figure out if I can pack the suitcase full of all the stuff that I need, and maybe I'll make a fresh loaf while I'm there. Well, I've got a lot of stuff here, and I remember that fancy flour that you that yeah. you like to have. I can yeah. I can hunt that down here. So, yeah. Ryan, thank you so very much. I really appreciate your time and sharing your delicious recipes with us. And uh, thank you for everything that you're doing in the world, all the wonderful work that you guys are doing there at Minnesota Opera and and bringing spectacular, meaningful art to, to people uh, online and in person. Thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing. I appreciate that, Denise. Very, very much appreciate it. And thank you. I, I, I get so much joy and, uh, and sense of fulfillment out of watching what you do for the community too and getting to work with you on projects is really special. So uh, thank you too. You're very welcome.